Hello all, I believe there's uh, well over 100 of you online. Uh, I'm getting old and gray now, so I have to put my glasses on to actually see uh, the presentation which I created for you overnight. So firstly, welcome. It's uh, actually nice to be presenting at Rand Swiss, and I'd like to uh, thank Gary Boyce and his team for giving me the opportunity to actually uh, engage with you. Um, the small to mid cap space is a, is a unique one. Uh, as I've said, I've covered this segment now for the best part of 26 years, and it's quite a rarity for an analyst to cover that uh, segment for such a long uh, period of time. Uh, you, not, you don't just build up a, a wealth of relationships uh, with your corporate clients, but you build up a, a history of having gone through a number of cycles. You know, everyone will remember the 1987 crash, uh, perhaps the 1998 Russian crisis, then the Lehman Brothers and the subprime crisis in the late uh, 2000s. So, and now the Ukraine war. And I've been lucky enough, perhaps, or unfortunate enough to have been through many, many cycles in my life. And I bring that into, into play as well. So this presentation is gonna be, uh, be quite uh, lighthearted. It's gonna be very easy going. And as I said, if you have any questions towards the end, Gary will come back in and help me out because I'm not very tech centric. So without any further ado, I'll kick in the presentation. If I can work out how the slides work. Let me do, let me do that. Yep. Bear with me a second because I'm not very great for technology. Um, so that's me. I've just given you a, a basic background as to who I am. Uh, as I've said, I've covered the small to mid cap sector since 1996. Uh, I used to be a broker in London uh, covering the emerging markets. And then post the, um, the fall of apartheid and the democratic government coming in in 1994, um, when banks in this country could actually buy stockbrokers, I was headhunted from London by an old brokerage firm called Anderson, Wilson and Partners, which some of you out there may remember, and they became standard equities. And uh, from that point, I've joined a succession of very well-known brokers from Nedbank, Board of Executives, Barnard Jacobs Millet, amongst others. And since the start of 2019, um, I've been a fully independent analyst, basically, again, uh, providing bespoke research to an institutional client base. I have no real uh, pri uh, private client association, so uh, I'm very happy to uh, work alongside Rand Swiss in creating this presentation for their benefit and from yours. Moving on, um, many of you may know me. Um, I'm quite active in the media space. I have a, a Twitter platform called at Small Talk Daily. Uh, if you don't follow me, please do. You'll pick up uh, quite a lot of interesting tidbits and general commentary. And there are some of the, uh, the institutions and the periodicals that I actually get involved in. I'm a regular contributor on CNBC. I write for the Financial Mail. Uh, the Investors Monthly, I, uh, I, I, I write a significant amount on a, on, a, on, a, on a basis. And of course, the radio as well. Um, I'm fairly, I'm fairly uh, 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 on, on a regular basis. So why am I here? Well, here we are at the Stock Exchange in 2021, after many years of a, an extremely weak performance, the best segment of a JSE actually was the small cap index. Um, if you were in the small cap index last year, you would have made roughly 52% return in your money versus on average 24% for JSE all share and slightly more for the mid cap index. But it's all changed in 2022, where again, because of the, uh, the fall off in some of the big heavyweights on the JSE, particularly NASPERS and Process, uh, the JSE all share is flat for the year and the uh, JSE small cap index, having had a very, very good run in 2021, is basically, basically trending sideways. It's a mid cap index over the last uh, quarter that's done extremely well, up by, by about 3.2% on a relative basis. Let me move on. So there's the small cap index, again, just showing you what it's done last year and what it's done this year. I'll leave it there for a second for you to see. Then there's a the mid cap index, again, you know, it's had a fairly good performance last year, but it was, uh, it was outshone by the small cap index. And then there's the dear old all share, uh, where all the stocks that uh, are listed on the, uh, the main boss are. And again, it's at a fairly flat year for the reasons that I've mentioned. As some of the large heavyweight stocks like Naspers and Process have underperformed, and the stronger RAND, which I think is up, uh, was about 8% stronger year to date, has uh, meant some of the RAND hedges have come up their best. So again, the mid cap segment has been the place to be. So I'm going to start off with uh, when I started at the beginning of this year. I put out a top five stocks um, in my universe for every year that I've been operating. 
Um, I've had a fairly good lucky run. And this year, um, in early January, those are the five stocks that I chose. And this was updated as a close of business on Friday. So you'll see the date fairs of yesterday, which is when I did this presentation for Rand Swiss. The five stocks were eMedia, Invicta Holdings, Renogen, Sapcap, and Receiseware. Now, it's a strange bag of stocks that is a combination of some speculative stocks, some very, very small caps, uh, some quality blue chips, and, uh, and a couple of what I called wild cards. And again, on, a, on an overall basis, I've outperformed the benchmark indices quite comfortably. The only one that's holding me back is eMedia. Um, eMedia, for those of you who don't know, uh, is the parent company um, that owns eTV. Um, it's actually part of Hoskins Consolidated Investments, also a company that I cover. And eMedia, for quite some time, uh, has underperformed the market. Uh, primarily in the last two years because of COVID, where there was a, a slowdown in advertising and uh, the company didn't perform that well. But uh, recent interim results show, saw a rebound back in earnings and they paid a very, very generous fat dividend, which HCI um, was, uh, was, uh, was happy to have. So I think even though the share price is down since the start of the year, um, I expect results to come out in the, uh, in the coming weeks to rebound, I'm looking for about between 45 and 50 cents of the year, and probably a dividend uh, of probably about 38 to 40 cents. So you're basically buying the stock potentially in a dividend yield of 10%. Now, not every stock is going to be a growth stock. In some portfolios, you're looking for income. And I think being that uh, HCI is a majority shareholder in uh, eMedia, and they want the dividends to help uh, downpay their debt and to fund uh, their empowerment partners and the underlying unions that own their investments, eMedia to me, uh, on a recovering advertising market, looks a very interesting play. Invicta Holdings, again, has had a fantastic year. It's up nearly a quarter since the beginning of the year. Most people know Invicta Holdings. It uh, provides what I would call widgets and spare parts to pretty much anything that moves uh, in this country in the industrial and mining space. And it has been heavily sold off over the last few years uh, due to a combination of problems with high debt and very weak performance from the underlying economy. But uh, under the new leadership of Stephen Joffe that came in as CEO about two years ago, uh, you've seen the SARS liability vanquished, you've seen debt completely repaid, and the company is now back in a growth track. It's still trading at a discount net asset value. Uh, it's a March uh, year end, so I'm expecting a very good trading update to come out from Invicta in the next uh, month or two. And I'm still very comfortable with that share price, despite it being up nearly a quarter. When we got Renogen, now this stock was updated on Friday. Um, it's been a wild card of mine since the beginning of 2021. Uh, as a bit of basic background for those that don't know the stock, it's currently a 5 billion rand market value company, probably about 5.5 billion as I speak because of a transaction announced this morning. And it's involved in alternative energy. It has a very large um, exploration base in the free state where it basically looks for methane. And then methane is condensed into liquid natural gas, LNG. And because of a high concentration of very rare gases uh, in that uh, dome in the free state, uh, there's a very, very high concentration of helium. And helium currently is one of the uh, glory uh, gases globally. It's used not just in sending rockets into space and cooling MRI scanners and involved in cooling data centers and making semiconductor chips. It also makes party balloons, but that's just a small sideline. And Renogen is sitting on one of the largest deposits of uh, high quality methane in the world. Uh, Virginia phase one is due to come on stream in uh, April. And then Virginia phase two, which is 10 times larger, should come on stream probably 2024, 2025 at a capital cost of between 12 and 15 billion rand. So Renogen was uh, selected by myself at the beginning of 2021 at 13 rand a share, and it closed that year up 161%. So why would I choose it as my wild card for the second year? Because I believe that the underlying prospects of the company were still sufficiently good for me to recommend the stock at just under 34 rand. As we speak this morning, the stock is trading roughly 44 rand because uh, this morning at 8 a.m., they announced on the Australian Stock Exchange and the Johannesburg Stock Exchange that they've signed an agreement with the government-owned Central Energy Fund, where the Central Energy Fund, or CEF, is investing 1 billion rand for a 10% stake in one of Renogen's subsidiaries called Tetra 4. 
which is basically liquid natural gas uh, fuel operation. So in theory, if you extrapolate that out, the whole of Renogen, just that single division, means that on a simplistic basis, Renogen, without doing anything, is worth 10 billion rand, which is basically double its current market cap. So I'm not surprised the share price has uh, hit uh, new highs this morning, and I think it'll continue to run uh, in the days and weeks ahead as more news uh, comes out. And of course, the taps start to be turned on Virginia phase one uh, in the next month or so. SAPCAP is a stock that may not be uh, known to many of you out there. Um, it's basically an investment holding company, probably market value around uh, two and a half billion rand with, with assets under value of around 3.5, 3.6 billion. But the gentleman behind the company um, is an extremely well-known entrepreneur. His name is Chris Seabrook, and I've known him for the best part of 25, 26 years. Uh, he's been on the boards of Data Tech, Altron, MassMart, and he's a very successful businessman and entrepreneur in his own right. So what you're basically buying in the SAB cap is what's called a family wealth office. Uh, what that means simplistically is if you're a fantastically wealthy individual, you can run an office just to look after your own money. Uh, so Christopher Seabrook thought, well, you know what? If I'm doing this for myself, why don't I list a vehicle and allow other parties to participate in what is my own family money? So when you're investing in SABCAP, you're not just investing in a basket of unlisted assets, unlisted assets in the likes of Metrophile and some offshore assets, but you're basically buying into the family wealth business of a very successful entrepreneur with a 30 or 40 year track record. And the company of, over the last 15, 20 years has shown a compound average growth rate in net asset value of around 16%. They'd recently had results and the net asset value grew uh, to about 94 Rand a share. So it's trading at about a 31% discount to net asset value, which is the average discount for investment holding companies. But SAP cap is different because you're basically buying into what is a private private equity type business, where Seabrook basically goes out and invests in stocks, which he sees has significant long-term growth potential, which you as individual investors would have no chance knocking on the door and buying a stake in perhaps one of the largest um, providers, for example, in labels that go into, into garments globally. It might not sound a, a very a glamorous business, for example, but every piece of clothing that you wear has to have labels showing you where it's made, how to care for it. And those labels cost money. And there are billions and billions of labels made a year. They have two businesses involved in that. They're also involved in an internet security company in London. Uh, they're based in a, in a cell phone business where they sell airtime and do valid, value added services and food businesses uh, alongside a portfolio of listed and unlisted assets. So SAP capped to me the current price of 62 Rand also has significant upside I and mean, it's a great long-term portfolio hold for any uh, credible small to mid cap fund. And lastly, it's a very, very small company, uh, not small in, this, in the space of uh, its market value, but it's, it's small in the greatest context of platinum. It's where Seasway. Uh, it was one of my uh, wild cards of this year when I chose it at uh, a random 12 cents because for many, many years, they were investing in developing a state-of-the-art mechanized a platinum operation in the bushveld. So most of the uh, traditional platinum operations used uh, lots of labor. They had to go underground. It was very expensive. And where Seasway thought they'd spend money on developing a mainly mechanized operation. And this, this year, they're coming into production and having spent the best part of 12 or 13 billion rand, I think from memory, in developing this mine, we're now going to start getting ounces out of the ground. And what really changed the perspective for Wasizwe uh, was in uh, quarter four last year, uh, a competence persons report came out, which basically means in simplistic terms, what the experts think this company may be worth uh, on a discounted cash flow and on uh, the valuation of the reserve and resource in the ground. And they came out with a valuation of between eight and 10 Rand a share. And back then the, trade, the share price was trading below a Rand. So I thought, mm, that's interesting. It's trading at below Rand but the experts think it's worth between eight and 12 or eight and 10. What am I missing? So I did, I did a bit of basic research and lo and behold, they were basically talking some sense. So I thought I'd, I'd put where C's were in at around 12 and so far it's done fantastically well. So all in all, my, my top five of the year has done reasonably well. 
And uh, I think I'd be very happy to own or even buy Bose 5 and still hold for the rest of the year. Let me move on to the next slide and catch a sip of water briefly. So what's catching my eye currently in my portfolio stocks? I'm gonna briefly run you through uh, some stocks which I think have some really interesting potential over the next 12 to 18 months. A lot of our, the work that I do as a small cap analyst isn't just reporting on the results and the news flow that comes out from uh, JC listed companies. I get involved a lot in companies that perhaps will be listing or perhaps uh, who are doing corporate restructuring. But in many cases, I like to look at what's called special situations. Companies that perhaps are unloved by the market for a combination of reasons, perhaps poor track record, uh, perhaps the management is not that well liked, perhaps the management uh, doesn't communicate well with the market, perhaps there are no analysts covering the story, and something or a catalyst can actually occur that can dramatically change the sentiment of that stock uh, towards investors and the market. And the ones that I'm going to run by are some of those examples. CMH. Uh, is an abbreviation for Combined Motor Holdings, uh, a stock that many of you may know as uh, one of the leading car uh, dealerships in this country. The largest is Motus, which was spun out of, out of Imperial, and Combined Motor Holdings, based in Durban, is a tenth of the size, but it's basically run by the same gentleman, Jeb McIntosh, that founded the company uh, back in the early 70s, and he and his partners still are the majority shareholders. He's now in his 70s, and he's one of the sharpest guys but I know in running his own business. And I like running and sorry, I like managing and looking after family run businesses. So this stock for quite some time was languishing under a cloud as its bigger brother Motus was racing away. Now Motus had very, very good results a couple of months back. And I thought, well, if Motus is having good results, there is no reason that CMH being smaller shouldn't be doing as well or better. And then in early February, they came up with a trading update, which said that earnings were actually going to fly. They'd be up north of 70%, and the share price took off. Uh, you could have bought CMH uh, probably a good year ago at around 12 Rand. We're at 27 Rand currently. And with a 2 billion Rand market value, uh, I estimate they're sitting at about a billion Rand in cash. So given the forecast that they've put out, the stock is trading on an average price earnings ratio on their midpoint earnings of around six and a half times. Now, if you strip out the cash, now you're looking at a stock probably in a P of between three and four. And at some point, there'll have to be some restructuring of the company because the current owners and CEOs are, are not getting any younger. They're in their 70s. CMH is an extremely well-run business. Cash positive, cash flush, and they know how to watch for pennies. They also own First Car Rental, and if you're involved currently in anything tourism related, you'll know that renting a car in this country currently is near impossible, and you're paying through the nose to get any form of, uh, of vehicles to run around in. So when uh, car manufacturing gets back to normality because of a chip shortage, and car sales domestically move back to an average of between 500 to 600,000 vehicles a year, they're currently around 450,000, CMA should benefit from a tourism angle, as well as a new car sales angle. So to me, CMH at 27 Rand remains one of my top selections in the small to mid cap space. A second stock is a lot larger. Its market value is 21 billion Rand. Everybody knows Ital Tile. They own the uh, upmarket Ital Tile brand. They own CTM in the mid market. And then for the lower end market, they own a company called Top T. Now this company again is family owned by the, Rav by the Ravazzotti family. And it's been a company that I've covered for the best part of 25 years. For the last 12 months, the share price has been fairly flat. It hasn't really gone anywhere. But sometimes having a stock that goes nowhere in a market that is going down can be a good thing, because on a relative basis, you're still outperforming, particularly when it pays a very good dividend and or special dividends. So Ital Tile, uh, apart from being the synonymous retailer of taps and tiles and barbs and all the other requisites that you know, also owns uh, Easy Life Kitchens. It owns all its own property, and it also owns Ceramic Industries, which is the largest manufacturer of sanitary ware in this country. So uh, it makes toilets and barbs and sinks, et cetera, et cetera. So it's completely vertically integrated. So 80% of what it basically sells is sourced or manufactured domestically. 
which means it's not impinged by all the supply chain disruptions that we have seen, but it's hit many other listed stocks because they can't get products from China because of port delays, and there's been a high shipping cost because of the supply chain problems, et cetera, et cetera. So Ital Tile is fairly self-reliant on domestic manufacturing. So a 21 rand billion rand market value and a share price of around 16 rand. It's been fairly pedestrian so far this year. The share price is basically down roughly five or 6% from memory. But it's a one that any credible mid cap portfolio should own. As I said to you, it pays consistent dividends. Um, it's been a fantastic long-term performer. And I often like to buy great quality stocks when the market is slightly overlooking them. Everybody thinks the DIY boom is over. And to a certain extent, it is. We were all at home over COVID, repairing our bathrooms, putting in new tiles, repairing our homes, and now we're going back to work. Um, the money is being uh, redistributed to going out and enjoying ourselves. But it's not to say that the homes are being ignored. So someone like Ital Tile, which has a very conservative balance sheet and very good growth prospects in the lower, middle, and upper end should continue to gain traction, gain market share, and deliver very good um, earnings and dividends in the future. Moving on, um, I've chosen an interesting stock which may be contrary to uh, many of you out there. It's Signia. It's a stock that I've known for many, many years. I was involved in the listing of the stock in the stock exchange here, probably the best part of, I think it was 2015, 2016 from memory. Uh, it's run by the well-known uh, entrepreneur and uh, civil activist, Marta Vyajiska. And the share price is currently uh, uh, about 16 rand a share. Year to date, it's around, it's down about 10%. Um, results for September 2021 came out fairly recently, and they showed a very pleasing 16.6% rise in earnings year on year, and it paid a 1 rand 35 dividend. Now, the reason why I chose Signia again is because certain portfolios uh, need to have a stock where income is important. At the end of the day, uh, the family who owns Signia, the Viajuska family, are the largest underlying owners of that stock. Um, they own roughly 60 to 65% of the company. And as such, dividends is very import important for the family and, of course, any minority shareholder. So whilst the company does have a certain uh, degree of volatility because it is a market stock, so the, if the stock market goes up, the underlying assets under management rise and they make more you know, fees from the underlying assets under management or AUM. If a market is going down, then again, the AUM goes down, so they collect a slightly smaller fee. But what Signia has very successfully done is it has expanded its portfolios into higher value margin uh, ETF uh, um, funds. Uh, you might know the Fourth Industrial Revolution, the Healthcare Fund, uh, the Oxford Scientific Fund, and it's moved offshore. And that's helped offset uh, some of the weakness we've seen in the institutional market. And its retail segment is growing extremely quickly. So at the end of the day, even though the stock is down for the year, um, I'm expecting a fairly um, interesting uh, result for the year, probably at maybe only 8 or 10%, which might not, not sound great. But if you were to pay a dividend of between, call it 140 to 150 on the current share price, that's a dividend yield of around 9%. And that's a lot better than you're going to get in any money market rate. And you possibly have the potential upside of some capital appreciation. And that's why I've put Signia in a bit like Ital Tile. Sometimes you need some dividend potential and some capital appreciation in your portfolio. Another sip of water. A complete um, speculative stock is a small cap counter called York Timbers. The York Timbers for anyone that doesn't know the company, owns plantations and sawmills uh, on the borders of Swaziland. And uh, it's one of the largest producers of timber uh, in this country involved in the construction segment and anything else timber related. Uh, back in the day, York Timbers was best known for making clothes pegs, uh, ironing boards and, uh, and laundry racks, but it's since diversified into general timber. And uh, in the last uh, 12 months, an activist has come on board under the guise of A2 Investment Partners, who took a material stake in the company, they own about 20%. And the share price was then trading ooh, well under two rand. 
and it runs to a recent share price high of four rand on the hopes that the activists would shake up a stock which for the best part of 10 years had made no real money, had shown no real prospects in terms of growing its underlying earnings and had not paid a dividend to any shareholder, including the IDC or its empowerment partners for the best part of a decade. The share price had a nice little run. Over the last couple of months, it has retreated. Uh, it's still up nicely from when the activists got involved. But year to date, it's down about 29%. Now, that would concern many people. Uh, it doesn't concern me. Because when I get involved in a company, which is a special situation, I'm in for the long haul. It takes a great deal of time to change the underlying culture of a company, to replace a board, to put decent management in place, and to change the underlying operational structure and operational running of a company. So York Timbers is work in progress. So if I was happy to buy it uh, in the freeze, which I was, I'd be still very happy to buy it at two rand 75. So there's uh, a lot of sort of talk in the market currently about ongoing restructuring. I'm awaiting news at some point that a new CEO will be appointed following the untimely passing uh, of the old CEO last year due to COVID. And uh, I think there's some more restructuring, uh, probably uh, emanating that company in the course of the next six months. So I've got a target price of four rand. So at the current level of two rand 75, uh, despite it being down for the year and it being a special situation, it's a stock that I would very comfortably hold for the next 12 to 18 months. And I'm, I'm expecting a nice uh, bump up in the profits and the earnings in due course. Moving on to a stock which I know has caught the market imagination, especially uh, on the Twitter crowd for the last couple of years, it's Renogen. As I said earlier, Renogen is basically involved in the extraction of gas in the free states, where it has a very large license concession covering about 187,000 hectares. Now, there's been gas in that free state area uh, since the 1950s. But South Africa, as you know, uh, is dominated by coal. Uh, we have some of the best coal reserves in the world. So when uh, gas was discovered in the free state in the 50s and 60s, it wasn't exploited because we as a, as a nation had sufficient coal to meet all of our electricity needs. Scroll on 50 years and the energy demand situation globally has changed. Well, coal is now seen as a very dirty carbon intensive uh, emission um, fossil fuel. And the world is moving towards cleaner, greener ESG certified um, energy such as liquid natural gas, LNG, which is basically a condensate of methane, which is in abundance in Renogen's free state license. The other interesting thing about that free state license is that in the composition of methane, there is a very high concentration of helium alongside other gases such as nitrogen um, and oxygen. Certain wells have a 12% helium concentration which on a global basis is off the charts. Any other major international helium production site, be it in the US, in Canada, in Russia, in Algeria, amongst others, Jenny has a helium concentration rate coming out of his gas wells of between one and 2%. Some of Renogen's are up to 12. On average, they're between three and four. So you can say that they're at least double the average global rate. Secondly, their hit rate is very, very high, and the gas well sits at very shallow depths of between 300 and 550 meters. So they basically drill a hole, they strike gas in the fractures, they then bring the gas to surface. It is liquefied at extremely cold temperatures down to about 168 degrees for liquid natural gas and down to 215, 218 degrees for liquid helium, and then that product is stored in, uh, in cylinders and then sold uh, to varying parties. So as it stands right now, um, there are two phases inside Renogen. There's Virginia phase one, which is due to start production in the next month. That cost a billion rand and will produce roughly uh, 350 kilograms of helium a day and between 45 and 55 tons of liquid natural gas. Now, quite a significant proportion of that helium and liquid natural gas has been contracted uh, by uh, the, the various parties. Consol and Italtile um, have recently taken the agreements for liquid natural gas. 
but the real money spinner inside Renogen will be Virginia phase two, which will be between 10 and 12 times larger than the current operation. And will have a capital cost of between 12 and 15 billion rands. So you're probably thinking to yourself, that's a great deal of money. Now, Renogen, when I picked this company last year, had a market value of under 2 billion rand. As we stand today, it's at about five, five and a half billion, which is still a significant discount to the money that it needs to raise for its Virginia phase two. So where's the money coming from? The answer is quite simple. In the last couple of weeks, there's been a number of strategic news announcements where some international investors have taken strategic equity stakes in the company. Uh, a Canadian American multi-billionaire called Robert Friedland that owns Ivanhoe Mining, a very successful entrepreneur in global commodities, a saw the potential in Renogen, and he has potentially committed up to $250 million, or around 4 billion rands, to help fund Virginia Phase 2. This morning on the JSC and on the Australian Stock Exchange, we saw the government Central Energy Fund commit 1 billion rand for a 10% stake just in the liquid natural gas a division of Renogen called Tetra 4. They've also launched a helium token, which will be traded in the next two weeks, um, but it'll raise another 300 million uh, uh, rand. So all in all, of a 12 to 15 billion rand capital cost, they've raised around 40% of the money that they need. And the balance will come from a combination of debt funding and other international funding. So all I want to say regarding the uh, remaining funding is watch this space. Renogen today is up around 10%. I think the last price I saw on the JSE before I came online with Rand Swiss was around 44 Rand. Um, it's up from 34 Rand when I selected the stock at the beginning of this year, and it was 13 Rand when I selected the stock at the beginning of 2021. My target value for Renogen is 60 Rand. So whilst a great deal of the easy money has been made, uh, there is still upside to this company. But I do have a caveat that because they haven't started producing the real large quantities of liquid natural gas and helium, that will only come on stream between 2024 and 2025 with a certain de degree of elemental risk regarding the commissioning of the project. Will it actually uh, operate on time? Will it go to budget? And of course, money needs to be spent to put the capital uh, in place to build the site. So certainly not for widows and orphans or for Aunt Maud's uh, pension fund, but for any fund that wants to have a, a growth element and wants to put a small percentage of their, of their pension fund or their growth fund into a stock, which I think catches the imagination. Uh, Renogen is one, but I would certainly keep a very close eye on. Moving on, uh, Stadio. Um, I've covered the education sector uh, as an analyst for the best part of 26 years. Now, for those with long memories, um, there were companies listed back in the day like Educor, which was part of NASPERS, that was sold off. Advertech, which owns uh, Trinity House, Crawford College, Abbott's College, amongst others, and uh, Damlin and, uh, and, and Varsity College, has been around for the best part of 30 or 40 years. Stadio basically was hidden inside Coro Holdings, which is a school business, which listed out of the PSG stable I think from memory about 2010, it became independent probably four or five years ago, and it is primarily an online tertiary business. But what I mean by that is after you've done your matric, if you want to go to a, a varsity to do any form of professional qualification, be it a BCom or an LLB or an accounting qualification or a teaching qualification, uh, up until a few years ago, you could either go to any of a well-known um, uh, state institutions like Tux or Wits or UCT or Stellenbosch, et cetera, et cetera. And there were a handful of uh, accredited tertiary operations, but they didn't really have the cachet or the gravitas that the, the well-known state institutions had. Stadio is one of the first companies that has got accreditation from the education department to actually offer what I would call equivalent courses that you would get of the likes of a UNISA or any of the mainstream institutional um, varsities out there. They have about uh, over 90 qualifications. So you can do engineering and law and a host of trade qualifications. And in due course, they want to do nursing and medical because of a demand. 
Now, the reason why I like Stadium is it's asset light because more than 80% of its learning is done online because most of the people doing tertiary education have gone through schooling. They've been through a school environment and they can actually learn by themselves at their own pace online from home or perhaps if they're working as a supplementary uh, to their own qualification to aid their career, potentially to you know, get a promotion or to potentially move offshore. So I'm very excited about tertiary education because in an economy like ours, which has very high unemployment, one has to keep upgrading one's qualifications in order to remain relevant in a constantly dynamic and ever-shifting environment regarding the, uh, the job market. So someone like Stardew, which, is, which does quality online education with an ability to get qualifications which should enable you to be in a better position to get a physical job, I think is very well placed in the longer term. The results out recently, which uh, again, pleased the market. The share price year to date is up about 8%. It is off a high many years ago of 8 Rand 50. And I think as it stands right now at 3 Rand 80, um, I would certainly uh, put Stardew in a long-term portfolio. In my ranking of the education stocks, which is Advertech, Kuro, and Stardew, my number one pick would be Stardew because it's asset light and doesn't need much capital investment to grow its business. The second would be Advertech, and the third would be Kuro Holdings. So for me, if I had to be in education, I would want to be in tertiary education, and Stardew to me is the one to be in. I'll take another sip of water. I'll briefly glance through this slide because I don't want to get too technical. Um, this is going to be a very interesting little segment that I intend to race through, hopefully fairly quickly, so as not to uh, take up too much time. You'll know by going out into uh, your supermarket that the cost latterly of bread, milk, or any grocery has gone up exponentially. We all know the cost of fuel has risen dramatically in the last few months. Uh, a combination of a world reopen reopening up after COVID and the demand once again for, for fuel, for flights and for cars and general transportation. But latterly, because of the Russian-Ukrainian war, there's been a huge spike in, uh, in oil prices because of the fact that Russia is a major producer of oil and sanctions mean that potentially a significant quantity of global fuel has been removed from the market. The same is true in soft commodities. Soft commodities are the things that touch our lives every single day. Pretty much everything that you eat on a daily basis generally has wheat, corn, sunflower oil, um, or canola oil, or any of the soft commodities actually in the composition of a product that you're eating. And if you look at that chart there, year to date, there's been significant price inflation in the underlying soft commodities of every single basic input that goes into food, which means that food inflation is soaring. What does that mean? It means that if you're a farmer, you're doing quite well because the underlying prices that you're getting for every hectare of field crop that you grow is increasing because of international demand for the product. And because Russia and Ukraine are major exporters of wheat and soft commodities, there's a bit of a current global squeeze. Additionally, the fertilizer market has boomed. Uh, and as such, the input cost of growing your food has also increased sharply year on year. So there's significant food price inflation currently in the marketplace, not just, but not just in this country, but internationally. And you've seen that on the prices that you pay for your basic foodstuffs. Simplistically, that means if I was a farmer, I'm making lots of money. If I'm a food producer, which actually produces the goods that you eat, like Tiger Brands or Anglovol Industries or Rhodes Foods, you are being squeezed because you're having to pay a great deal more of the underlying raw materials that make the commodities that you basically consume, but you aren't able to fully recover the cost of that product because you simply cannot put up the prices of your foodstuffs in such a dramatic fashion. I'm looking there at wheat. On an international basis, the price of wheat in the last couple of months is up nearly 50%. Are you telling me that you can raise the price of a loaf by 50% in the last couple of months? The answer is no, which means that somebody somewhere is losing money. And it's not the retailer, because they're generally pass on their prices. It's generally the manufacturer who gets squeezed. So I would keep a very close eye on food price inflation. It'll have a dramatic impact on what I'm about to tell you next, and where certain food 
and food-related stocks will go over the next 12 to 18 months. There's some charts here. Um, these are two charts that I check on a daily basis. Um, they are absolutely worth keeping an eye on, even if, even if it's once a week. The chart in the blue there is the current price of US corn, or we call it mealy meal, maize. It's at 7 Rand 54 a bushel. Look at that spike there. You could have bought that uh, commodity for under four Rand, sorry, under four dollars six months ago. It's nearly doubled and tripled in the last uh, 12 months. That has been fed through in the local SAFEX market. Look at the, the SAFEX price of yellow, of yellow maize. You could have bought SAFEX three years ago at 1,850 Rand a ton. As I stand here today, it's north of 4,000 Rand a ton. Do you really believe that food, food manufacturers and anybody that uses maize to rear chickens that go into uh, you know, the, the meat that we eat every day or to, uh, to produce milk, for cows to produce milk, uh, the feed, or even the eggs, they can pass on that cost increase. They can't. So there's been margin contra contraction and margin squeeze. Look at food price inflation. This is data for the uh, end of the year last year from a Bureau of Food and Agricultural Policy in Pretoria. It's the country's leading think tank on, uh, on food, farming, and inflation. Look at those underlying price increases in the basic foodstuffs that we eat. A lot of that has been driven because the underlying costs of rearing animals or producing bread or any of the goods that we take for granted on a daily basis has soared. Something has to give, and that is generally margin at the food manufacturers, which is why food manufacturers have had very, very poor results for the last 18 to 24 months. And my net recommendation since the beginning to mid of 2020 has been short food producers, long agriculture. There again is the wheat price. That major spike you see in the last month, six weeks, is when the Russian-Ukrainian war started. Uh, on February the 24th, when the tanks rolled into Ukraine, um, there was concerns that the sanctions on Russia and the inability of Ukraine, which is a major exporter of wheat, to actually provide the, the world with uh, sufficient produce would lead to a squeeze on the underlying wheat price, and the price rocketed. It went from an average of around six to seven dollars uh, a bushel to a higher thirteen dollars. We're now back to about eleven, and that's the type of inflation that we see in a very very short space of time. Will it normalize? Yes, but in the short term, there is significant pain in the food uh, manufacturing sector, and I would remain uh, a net short of that sector, and I would avoid it. You've seen recent results from the like of a Tiger Brands and AVI um, indicate that food price inflation and margin compression going forward is going to be evident for at least another 12 months. Again, similar charts. Um, I've told you that the uh, underlying costs of producing the food has increased. Look at that chart there in, uh, in pinky orange for fertilizer. If you're a farmer, your underlying cost of fertilizer per uh, hectare has more than doubled. That cost has to be recouped somewhere. So they generally pass the cost on, and that is then fed through into the international markets for the price that we, the consumers, ultimately pay for anything that we consume. So fuel has gone up, if fertilizer has gone up, if chemicals has gone up, if transportation has gone up, something has to give, which means food prices have risen. And as such, we are paying a great deal more as a consumer. But in this country, as you know, with very high unemployment, a significant proportion of the population living on government grants, no real economic growth, uh, modest underlying capital uh, investment, it is very difficult for the consumer to currently uh, cope with surging uh, food prices, which means at some point, uh, something has to give. And that give point is generally volumes where in order to procure the food that the masses need to eat, they only have a finite amount of money in their pocket, so they tend to buy less. That will have a dramatic impact to the food producing sector again for the next six to 12 months. For every threat, there is always an opportunity. Uh, on my Twitter page uh, some weeks ago, I quoted uh, Nathan Rothschild, 
uh, who was a famous banker in 1806. And he coined the quote during the English-French uh, War, which lasted seven years, which uh, eventually ended with the uh, Battle of Waterloo in 1815. He goes, buy on the sound of cannons, sell on the sound of trumpets, which basically means that when war starts, the market gets panicky and they sell everything. And when war ends, everybody is happy. So they should run out, should, they should run out and buy, but they generally sell. So in this case, when the Russian-Ukrainian war started, yes, it was a, a terrible uh, humanitarian tragedy with the displacement of millions of people and the untold costs uh, to human life and, and suffering. We've also seen soft commodities rise alongside fuel. But for every flip side, there has to be an opportunity. And in this case, I mentioned earlier that fertilizer prices went through the roof because Belarus and Russia are major exporters of fertilizer. And with, and with sanctions being in play, they are not allowed to export their product. With China also banning exports because of the problems in that country, roughly 50% of global fertilizer inputs are currently not available. So if I was a fertilizer company, I would currently be making money hand over fist. And one of the few, if not only, key fertilizer companies listed on the JSC is Omnia. I've had a buy on Omnia since July 2020 at 27 Rand 30. It's made two of my price targets at 50 Rand and 65. I increased that target last year to 80 Rand. And as I speak to you this morning, it's trading at around 73. It is a March year end. I'm expecting a truly astonishing trading update powered by agriculture and the explosives operation once again kicking back into earnings as global commodities come back into play as everybody starts mining again and, uh, and using dynamite to produce the very hard commodities like iron ore, nickel, et cetera, et cetera, that we all consume on a daily basis. And as such, uh, Omnia should have a very, very pleasing results um, in about May. They've also been selling off assets. They sold off Oro Agri last year, uh, which repaid all their debt. And then they also sold off an oils and lubricants division called Umongo Petroleum last year for 1.1 billion rand. So the company right now is debt free, and I believe is sitting on perhaps two to two and a half billion rand of net cash with a market value of around 11 billion rand. So notwithstanding very good results, I'm anticipating this year, I think there's a very, very good chance that like last year, where they paid a four rand special dividend and a two rand ordinary dividend, but they could pay a very, very healthy dividend this year. I'm forecasting anything between eight and 10 rand a share. Now, given the current share price of around 72, that could be a very juicy dividend yield um, if my crystal ball gazing actually uh, uh, transpires. At the bottom of a the report there, and I'm sure Rand Swiss will post this, are links to two reports that I recently wrote on Omnia detailing on why I think the company will perform very well this year and into its new financial year of 2023. So Omnia to me, when I wrote this at 70 Rand and 80 cents on Friday, um, has a target value of 80 Rand, but I think it'll go higher if, as I expect, the trading update and the results are up to my uh, forecast and they do indeed pay a special dividend. There's the uh, Omnia share price. You can see it had, uh, it's been in fits and starts. It goes sideways, jumps, sideways, jumps, sideways, recently jumping. And I think currently it looks very, very interesting. And if I was a, a gambling man, and I'm not because I hate gambling, I must be the only guy that went to Vegas many years ago and spent the grand sum of $1 on the slot machine because I don't like gambling. I like to know what I like to make money. And I can see Omnia uh, making my 80 Rand target and potentially moving higher. For those of long memories, um, its all time high was 160 Rand. I'm not saying it's going to get back there because the times were different, but I can certainly see the stock knocking on the door of 100 Rand within 12 months. Moving on to fruit, food producers, again, for every uh, threat is an opportunity. Uh, the agricultural sector has done fantastically well as an asset class in this country. Uh, we've seen soft commodities soar in value. And if you're, if you're a farmer growing wheat, canola, soya, maize, you've done very, very well in the last few years after a period of very weak performance due to poor weather 
and in the case of the Western Cape, uh, a 100 year drought. So we're now in the third successive year of extremely good upbeat earnings in the agricultural sector. And the two that I've chosen are both listed, Carp Agri on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and TWK Investment based on the Cape Town Stock Exchange and on A2X. Carp Agri may or may not be well known to many people. It's been uh, listed for quite a number of years. Uh, it came from the PSG stable. It had a large stake in Pioneer Foods back in the day, which has since been sold. It is now a nationwide agricultural business where a quarter of its revenues der derive from fuel, a quarter from convenience retailing, a quarter from agriculture, and a quarter from general retailing uh, via its Agrimart operations. I nicknamed this stock many years ago the Borough Mass Mart. So imagine Mass Mart, but just better run. This company, for the last uh, 10 years or so, has an average compound growth rate of around 15 percent per annum. At 48 rand 49, um, I'm forecasting earnings this year of a minimum of 5 rand 50 to 5 rand 75. So the PE is between 8 and 9. It pays a very good dividend. Um, it's recently bought a very interesting fuel transaction called PEG, which after the debt has been repaid in about three or four years, will lead to a significant cash overflow, which could lead to very healthy dividends. So Carp Agri to me is one of those well-run agricultural businesses with a market value of around 3 billion rand, which uh, is one of the hidden gems uh, of the JSE. TWK is a smaller business worth about 1.5 billion rand, but again, is a giant business, has, an, has a revenue of north of 8 billion rand and is immensely profitable. Again, involved in agriculture, but its main business is actually exporting wood chips uh, into the Asian market to make pulp and paper. So they own their own forests, they own their own sawmills, they produce 900,000 tons a year of timber-related products that go into all sorts of building materials in this country, which have been booming, and they also supply the Asian pulp market with uh, the raw materials to make paper. And as we all know, given the chances of working from home, with everybody having bought uh, new printers and laptops and PCs, the demand for uh, paper and ink has soared globally. And the demand for paper has also risen quite exponentially. So TWK is gonna have another very good year of results. Earnings last year were up 26%. We're about to issue interim results. The results should be out around the 12th of April. I'm forecasting another very, very good set of results. Uh, with, with the final uh, to August also on the horizon, I'm forecasting around six Rand 50. Uh, with a share price having derated from a recent high of 50 Rand down to 36, having listed on the Cape Town Stock Exchange at 35, soaring to 50, and now coming back to 36. It's one of those hidden gems, which very, very few people actually cover. I think I'm the only analyst and I'm giving you a heads up. If you want to be in agriculture, which has significant upside potential for the next two or three years, I would have a serious look at TWK investments. Two other stocks that I like are in the fishing sector. The fishing sector to me is very interesting. I've told you I'm not keen on food producers because they're tied into the rising input costs of soft commodities. Fishing is different. Globally, fish is a finite resource. You're generally given a license to catch a certain tonnage per annum. And as the world starts to eat better and the changing dietary habits of uh, particularly China moves towards more healthier products, um, fish is going to be a global resource um, which will have a long-term growth scenario. The two best plays uh, in the domestic market, I'll come to the second one later, uh, is Oceana Fishing and Sea Harvest. Sea Harvest to me is, a, is an interesting play. It's a mid-cap food counter, market value of around 5 billion rand. It also has a foods business involved in the production of cheese and butter called Cape Harvest Foods. But for the last couple of years, the earnings have done fairly well. It earned about 1 rand 65 this year, and it pays a reasonable dividend. But because of overexpansion in the dairy side, which didn't quite go to plan, and losses in the aquaculture business because it couldn't export um, because of the supply chain logistics issues 
and the fact that the Asian market was closed due to COVID, there were quite significant losses in the abalone business and teething problems in its milk and cheese operations, which caused the fishing side to do fantastically well and the food and agriculture business to actually bring the underlying business down. I selected this stock on the 14th of December, 2021 at 12.99. It got to nearly 17 Rand. We're now back to 16.20. I believe that this year, now that the fishing right allocation process has been done and dusted and everybody knows what their quota is for the next 15 years, even though Sea Harvest lost 4.3% of its take allocation, internationally, demand for fish remains robust. Uh, it earns very good money as an export play. And it's an extremely well-run company with a very, very good track record of actually producing, harvesting fish, and then exporting it. So to me, if I had to be in a fishing play, my number one pick in the sector is Sea Harvest at 1420. The second stock is a food producer, which goes against what I told you regarding being in the food producing sector. But Libstar to me is a, is a special situation. Not many people will know what the company is. It actually is a company that supplies products that I guarantee every single one of you listening to this webcast will have in their fridge, in their pantry, or in their grocery cupboard. If you shop at Woolworths, Checkers, or Pick and Pay, Spa, or any other retailer, many of their products will be in your cupboards. They're also one of the largest providers of, uh, of, of products to McDonald's. We do all the wraps for KFC. Uh, they own Denny mushrooms, as an example, and they also have the largest producer of chicken schnitzels, as an aside, into Woolworths. So many of the ready meals that you buy from Woolworths are probably made by Lipstar, but it's a, it's a holding company for a number of brands. Um, its current market value is about four and a half billion rand. It's trading at a P of around 7.5. Recent results were up just under 19% to about 80 cents a share. And even though it will be hurt in the next 12 months from slightly higher input costs, it's targeting a number of new growth vectors, particularly in the wholesale market for private label. Uh, the export channel is doing quite well. And I see significant change in the company coming in the next 12 to 18 months, which should lead to sentiment change regarding the company. Those that remember Libstar, it listed in May 2018 at 12 Rand 50. And in the first couple of months had a profit warning, which is a kiss of death for any new listing. And the share price ultimately bottomed at 5 Rand 50. The market was utterly unforgiving. And for the last few years, the share price has been trending sideways at between sort of 550 and 650 a share. It recently sold a loss-making division involved in what's called household and personal care, which again to the layman is washing, washing powders, uh, liquid soap, deodorants, et cetera, et cetera. They sold that, so a loss-making arm has gone. They're now a pure food business, expanding their business into value-added baby food, pet foods, and more value-added products to their key clients, which are Woolworths and Checkers, and the export market. I foresee ongoing change in the company in terms of new management coming on board. Um, the largest shareholder in the company is a private equity player. That fund has to wind up at the end of 2023, and that uh, 35 to 37% stake might get sold to a, a potential acquisitive party or could lead to some form of special situation. So I'm putting Libstar in as, a, as an undervalued play which has been overlooked by the wider institutional market, but to me has significant upside legs. If my crystal ball gazing uh, actually transpires. I've recently written a, a note on Libstar, and again, that will be on the link uh, post this presentation. On Oceana, I mentioned it's the largest fishing company in the country. It's been from the wars in the last uh, few months because of an investigation uh, from a whistleblower regarding potential financial irregularities in its US Daybrook um, fish meal operation. Now under US law, if a whistleblower blows the whistle, you have to investigate. So after an exhausting and very expensive multi-million rand legal and accounting uh, investigation, what have they come up with? Nothing. There was no fraud. There was no financial impropriety. 
It was just a, a, an IFRS accounting treatment, which was handled incorrectly, and a line item worth 4.3, sorry, $4.4 million had to be backdated, uh, which is insignificant in the scale of a 4.5 billion rand transaction that Daybrook was in 2015. But the trouble was, when you start having an investigation into a company, uh, you start to delve deeper. And inside Oceana, there were many um, issues that came to the fore. It's like opening up a can of worms. And uh, sadly, due to the drip, drip nature of news coming out from the company's uh, press releases, the market took fright uh, and the share price of the company fell from the high 70s. Uh, it plateaued at around 51 Rand. Now, 51 Rand, bearing in mind the company had already given you a reasonable trading update, saying that earnings would be down by around 10% of the year. I thought, well, this is a fantastic 100 year old business in a commodity which is in global demand. It owns Lucky Star Pilchards, which was badly hit during the pandemic because it couldn't actually source enough sardines internationally to meet domestic demand. There was shortage of supply of cans to actually pack the product. They had some very bad fishing seasons. And of course, their Daybrook operation also had a very unfortunate fishing season due to a combination of very poor weather in the Gulf of Mexico and a record hurricane season. So you could say that Oceana had a very, very unlucky 2021 through a combination of uh, natural causes, be it mother nature and the weather, and uh, unnatural causes due to their own uh, drip, drip of bad news. So 51 Rand, I thought, hmm, this stock's on a P of around nine. It certainly isn't gonna go bust. And the upside potential, once it cleans the house up, um, should see the share price starting to rebound. So we have seen the departure of the CEO. Uh, he suddenly resigned before results. We've got the CFO currently suspended and the company secretary also made a run for it. So it might not sound good in the face of it, but let's not forget, but as, as I said earlier, it has some extremely good products uh, in significant demand locally and internationally and with a new management team on board. They are looking to clean up their act, and I think that earnings should start to increase in the course of the 12 to 18 months. That's what they have indicated. I placed a buy in the stock about a month ago at 52 Rand. It's now at 58, and I think a target price of 70 Rand is easily achievable. As the bad news starts to wane, and the positivity of the company starts to emanate, I think that Oceana Holdings will start coming back into the, uh, the forefront of investors' minds. Another sip of water, please. There are six stocks that I chose in an article that I wrote for the Financial Mail back in November. Many of you may know there's been a significant number of delistings on the JSE, where I think last year from memory, over 25 stocks were either bought out or delisted because the, the onerous costs of either listing on the JSE or the fact that the institutional market did not want to be involved in supporting and buying small caps meant that private equity or management could buy out their businesses on price earnings ratios, which would seem absurd uh, to many people, uh, given they were bought out on P's of between fours, five, six, sevens, and eights. When I first started my career back in the JSE in 1996, the average PE ratio for a small cap company was in the high teens. It was around 18. Uh, in the late 2000s, it was probably about 12 to 14. As it stands right now, I can still pick up companies offering fantastic discounts to net asset value with growth prospects, cash in the bank, and they're unloved, unloved but between PEs of twos, threes, fours, and fives. So I wrote a piece of a financial mail stating that those six companies, Bola Metcalf, Metrophile, Mustek, Santova, York Timbers, and Zeda, for a combination of special situations and or potentials for buyouts would actually perform quite well. You can see that Bola Metcalf, since I wrote the report, is up 12%. Metrophile is basically flat, but uh, I still have great hopes for Metrophile. They had, they had flat recent results, I'm expecting a, a good second half, and there's still the bubble of a potential buyout from a number of international suitors. Mustek, the technology and services company, is up 12%. That 
That's trading on a substantial discount to net asset value and a price earnings ratio of only three times. Santova, the logistics company, is trading again on a P of around five. That's up 37% since uh, November. York Timbers, again, has a discount to net asset value of over 60%, with a net asset value of nine rand 52, I think. And yes, the share price is down. I'm utterly unconcerned. As the activists get their teeth into that company, and it's the same activist crowd that took Novus from 60 cents to Nova free rand, I can see York Timbers rebounding. When, of course, Zeda, which is part of a PSG portfolio, has recently announced it's unbundling its stake in, uh, in Carp Agri. There's also a potential special dividend coming from the sale of a logistics company where they sold that business involved in ports and rail for 1.6 billion rand, or roughly one rand a share to Zeda. And that stock to date is also performing uh, quite well, and I ex expect more from Zeda. And I'll be updating that list of, uh, of six in my next Financial Mail article uh, in August. What should I be looking at right now? Um, Hoskins Consolidated Investments, or its shortened name is HCI. When I wrote this presentation yesterday, it was trading at 107 Rand, close of business on Friday. This is a stock that I've been watching for quite some time. And I wrote a piece on HCI in the middle of last year at around 65 Rand, when the stock was trading at a material discount to its net asset value. Now, what is Hoskins Consolidated Investments? is actually a classic investment holding vehicle, but is best known for its assets inside hotels, gaming, and leisure. It owns, for example, Soho Sun. Uh, it owns Grand West Casino. It owns Monte, uh, Monte Vista Casino, uh, amongst other assets. During the COVID pandemic, when both uh, tourism, leisure, and gaming assets were closed, it lost a great deal of money. The bankers were knocking on its door because it was uh, leveraged uh, with debt, and the company was not performing that well. And the share price completely unwound. What a difference six months can make when people are going out again, spending money traveling, staying in hotels, eating out, gaming again, inbound tourism is back. And many of their underlying divisions involved in transportation, uh, in ETV, for example, all performing well. The real kicker in the last in the last month or so, but has really powered the share price. And my last buy was at 86 rand uh, in the early part of February. Was off the coast of Namibia. It had a small stake in an oil well, about a 25% stake. And that oil well, which was run by an international major called Total, struck it big. They struck a potential well of 1 billion barrels of oil. And HCI has a 25% stake in that well and some wells around that site. So the share price has run because everyone's now wondering what this oil potential um, investment is worth. Um, I've seen estimates in market, anything from between 50 Rand to 100 Rand a share, yet alone all the other assets which you're getting, uh, Soho Sun, uh, the gaming assets, um, the transport assets, ETV, et cetera, et cetera, is in there for next to nothing. So to me, uh, the stock is currently trading a discount to net asset value of around 31%. But this is a March year end. The CEO, Johnny Copeland, I think he's going to have a very, very good story to tell you uh, in the next uh, reporting period. And I wouldn't be surprised uh, for a trading update coming out in late April, early May, but they will have a, an astonishingly good trading update and a huge uplift in the net asset value as the underlying share prices and all its listed assets like, like Soho Hotels, Soho Gaming, E-Media, the NEB, amongst other things, start to reflect back to HCI. The market value, yes, it's probably you know, a six to seven billion run market value company, but that could be dwarfed by what the actual oil business is worth. So it's a speculative play, but it's certainly one to keep an eye on. And if I move to my last slide, um, there is uh, the HCI share price. You can see it plateaued uh, during the depths of COVID and since then it's run quite nicely. And I think as it stands right now, um, given the, uh, the March results 
and the potential for good dividends from its underlying interests and yet alone what its platinum and its oil assets are doing, HCI is certainly one to watch. So that's me. Um, that little, uh, little dog there is my pup Yarpy. He's as famous as I am. He works at home with me at, uh, in my home office. And from myself, Anthony Clark, on behalf of Ransford Securities and Gary Boyson, it has been an absolute pleasure to present you for the last period. I hope you've uh, gained a bit of information. I hope you've gained some really interesting ideas and some recommendations in my sector. And for any more um, information, I'm sure uh, your brokers at Rand Swiss will happily assist you. Otherwise, from me, I'm going to hand you back to Gary. Thank you so much. Um, we'll open for questions and answers. Great. Thanks, Andy. That, uh, that was great. Uh, yeah, so we've got a couple of questions here. Um, uh, how do you take the low liquidity of smaller companies into uh, consideration investing? I don't think you would take it into consideration. It's more, um, I mean, that's that's really, I think, on a client-by-client -client basis more than anything else. Uh, but I think what it does do is it creates a huge amount of opportunity for, for smaller investors, definitely. Uh, absolutely. In many cases, it depends on the, on the size of the business. Liquidity can be an issue. You know, if I was a major institutional investor and I wanted to buy a 10% stake in a small company, it might take me months. But if you were a reasonable sized a private client individual, uh, I've had no qualms in picking up uh, uh, stocks in reasonable volume in any of the small to mid caps that I cover. You know, unless you're dealing in institutional size qualities, the small to mid cap space is ideal for a private client investor. Perfect. I think we're going to leave it there because uh, we've got another crossing now shortly. But uh, yeah, Andy, thanks a lot for, for speaking to the guys. Um, we're probably going to do this uh, presentation probably once a quarter, uh, give you an update on the small cap sector. And uh, as always, uh, please feel free to give, give us a shout on info at Um And thank you for attending. Thanks so much.